Je vais la mourir et la Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second evening of Classical Vauxhall 2021 here in St. Mark's. Classical Vauxhall was established to build on Vauxhall's historic relationship with the arts and culture. Our series is very kindly supported by Vauxhall One, making Vauxhall a better place to live, work, do business, and enjoy the arts. And we're also very kindly supported by Lambeth Council and the English Arts Council. You can get in touch with us on social media, either tag us at be in Vauxhall or use the hashtag Classical Vauxhall, and please do get in touch as we'd love to hear from you. I'm thrilled and honoured that wonderful duo of Elena Uriosti violin and Tom Poster are going to perform the concert for us this evening, and they're going to choose a programme of works from both sides of the Atlantic, that famous special relationship. I caught up with Elena and Tom earlier on at Chino Latino at the Park Plaza to talk all things music, life and the programme for this evening, so take a look and enjoy the concert. 
So Elaine and Tom, thank you both so much for coming in and having a chat with us before your concert this evening. I guess most people most recently will recognize you from your wonderful Yuri Posty jukebox. Um, do you want to tell people who might not have checked it out yet a bit more about this initiative? Sure. Well, it is 88 days of small little music videos, um, which we dreamed up. I'll let Tom tell the story because it was really, I believe, your, your first impulse. Not sure. I mean, this goes back to lockdown number one last March. Um, and the fact that, at the, well, a couple of days before that lockdown, um, we were actually on opposite sides of the pond. We're, we're married, so we were quite keen to be in, on the same side of the pond, sort of not knowing how long this would last. So I flew into the States, like, the, the day before, well, no, the day that Donald Trump, like, closed the March, borders, March basically. 16th. March 16th. Um, you know, so I, sort of in this jet lag state, and with both of us having had all our concerts cancelled that same week, we sort of thought, well, what are we going to do? So, um, yeah, we came up with this idea to, well, initially just record a, a video of us playing something we liked. And then we thought, well, we could do this every day, you know, as long as this lockdown ends, not, not really knowing quite how long it was going to go on. So we, we made it sort of a request-based model. Um, we put a question out on our social media channels, like, what can we play for you? Um, we've got all the time in the world. Um, and we got uh, requests started coming in, some traditional, some, you know, popular songs. And then um, it was revealed that Tom, it, th these requests didn't have to be for violin and piano specifically, or originally, um, that Tom would be happy to arrange things um, for our combination of instruments. And then requests got very bizarre um, but and then this sort of yeah this this project unfolded and it wound up being 88 days um, everything from Mozart to baby shark from from Whitney Houston to Lily Boulanger was you know classic all, all sorts there um, yeah so 88 days of videos um, I think when we started we probably didn't imagine that lockdown would last quite that long but it seemed a seemed a nice round number, number of keys on a piano. And um, yeah, so that was our, our project. And people can look forward to, you guys have just recorded a secret album, or not so secret, so of secret. the Yuri Posty box. So that'll be coming out later on. Exactly, year. it's not 88 tracks, so don't worry. It's <laughs> no. not like a complete box Encyclopedia set, a jukebox <laughs> set. <laughs> but can I just go back to like your earliest musical memories? Like what, mm -hmm. what are your earliest musical memories and what do you think it was, or was there an event that really particularly inspired you to become musicians? The event that inspired me to uh, become a musician actually predates my functional memory. Um, however, it's a story my parents have told so many times that it feels like it's something that's in my brain. Um, I saw an episode of Sesame Street when I was two years old um, with Isaac Perlman playing the violin, and that is apparently what set me off. I just had to do that. Um, my parents are not musicians, so they thought this was quite strange. Um, I kept asking for a violin. They kept encouraging me to hold off. Um, but when I was five, I began um, taking, there, I went to a public, or I guess here you call it a state school um, in the Philadelphia area where I grew up. And um, I was lucky enough to have a Suzuki program at the school. So I started there, um, moved fairly quickly to private lessons. And yeah, that was my, the start of my path. And I, I'm also not from a, a family of musicians, but um, just was, kind of obsessed with music of all sorts from a very early, early stage, just hearing things on the radio or hear, hearing, hearing music in the street and just, just being totally fascinated by it. And it just sort of became my whole life very quickly, I think. And it, again, my parents were puzzled by it, but incredibly um, supportive. And in fact, it wasn't the piano um, that was the center at, at all for a long time. I just, I just loved music as a whole, and I sort of wanted to play everything. I wanted to write, and I wanted to hear, and I wanted, I just, yeah, so I was much more a kind of general musician in my, in my childhood, I think, and the piano then later in my teenage years just became my kind of um, truest voice, I suppose. But yeah, it was just, just a very early obsession from who knows where it comes from. Well, I'm the same. I'm not from a musical family, so it's yeah. nice to know that there's other people. Yeah. Because usually you feel a bit unique maybe or in a way or, or the oddball yeah, sometimes yeah, in the music be, world yeah. right um and then in terms of your duo like how did you guys meet obviously we know you're married but like, how did you meet musically and what kind of inspired that whole relationship so the professional relationship definitely came before the romantic one um we were put together on a sort of blind recording date by the bbc radio three um i was a uh, new generation artist at that time this was in um, 2013, in the spring, 
Um, Tom had been a member of the scheme uh, with his ensemble a few years prior, and I was doing a lot of flying over and um, requesting that my, at the time, American um, piano partner come and, and do a lot of recording with me. Um, and that was wonderful, but they finally were like, you'll play with someone here. <laughs> so, so she um, got stuck with me. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, wow. um, no, so we did, a, we did a session together. It was purely professional, very friendly, super easy. I think we realized that we liked working together. Um, then a couple years after, about two and a half years later, um, I was um, doing a residency at the Roman River Festival. Um, and they asked whether, as part of it, I would like to do a recital. Were there any pianists who I liked working with? And I remember giving Tom's name. I'm like, oh, I remember. And they were like, great, he's a festival favorite. Um, so, yeah, we came together to do that recital, and then the relationship would... The rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, not, not clear-cut history, but, yeah, it began to bloom. And I have a very fond memory of you guys. You both came to the West Wicklow Festival, which I run in Ireland, I think 2019. And I remember, Elaine, I think you started with some Schumann romances and then something very interesting happened swiftly as oh. you ended that piece. Do you want to tell the audience what happened? Yes. So, yeah, it wasn't even, I did, it wasn't even like an interesting bow flourish that I did. Um, I think at the end of the, the Clara Schumann romances, um, to which you refer, I just sort of, whacked my bow and the tip hit the music stand um, and a little piece of the tip fell off. Oh, it just made the shudders just thinking yeah. about it. Um, and I had already had, I had already had a um, crack in this particular bow. So I was like, oh my God, again, this, this thing is cursed. I'm cursed. Um, anyway, so yeah, what ensued uh, were many minutes of very undignified crawling around on my hands and he's looking for this little piece of my bow. We, we, yeah, yeah we were both scrabbling around, audience members like... I think I got up as well, we were all yeah, just yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, just so, like crawling around <laughs> looking for a portion of my bow. Uh, I think like a tiny piece was found actually, an yeah. audience. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. found that and we found your gold mute, I remember. Oh yeah, yeah left all kinds so, of stuff yeah. close to them. <laughs> yeah, so that was my, uh, that was my Irish debut, <laughs> crawling around. Well, many happy memories. I um, <laughs> And Tom, like you obviously a wonderful performer, but you also compose and arrange a lot. I'm just very curious, was this something that you always, like you mentioned as a child, just being like yeah. fascinated with the piano, were you always into arranging or was that something that kind of came a bit later on? Uh, composing, I was always really into. In fact, I wanted to be a composer more than I wanted to be a performer as a kid. Um, but I think you have to really want to compose and maybe I just didn't need to do it quite enough. It's, it's, it's sort of almost more self-destructive than, than playing, you know, we're self-critical enough, enough of, as pianists and violinists, but as a composer, you've got this little blank sheet of manuscript paper and it's, it's, you know, I, I, I found it too much in the end. Whereas arranging, like someone else has already written the tune or the piece and, and you know, you're just sort of polishing it and shining it up, allowing it to shine and it's, it's full glory. And so I find that like a good blend of, it satisfies some creative part of my brain, but I don't have to come up with the original <laughs> material. So, yeah, I, I love arranging. Elena, you describe yourself as a musician, yogi, writer and entrepreneur, as well as a lover of nature, food, animals and connecting with other human beings. Um, that was, by the way, just an attempt to make my bio sound less boring. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, and it also says you've been practicing yoga for over a decade and you're the co-founder of Intermission. Um, you'll be treating some of our younger viewers to a movement or an introduction to movement workshop. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what to expect? And um, I suppose it's not for even just younger people. Any, anyone yeah, of any age can, can tune in, right? Absolutely. So I started practicing yoga fairly seriously in 2009. And I came to it for totally non-musical reasons, but um, was pretty immediately um, very, very pleased with the, the benefits I was experiencing um, towards my, my violin playing, as well as just, you know, general life, health and happiness. Um, I, it was having such a profound impact on my muscles, how they felt, my concentration. Um, I was learning kind of accidentally tools to help me cope with performance anxiety, nerves. Um, so it was just, it opened up all sorts of doors for me um, musically. And um, over the years, my, my, my other life partner, <laughs> as I refer to her, Melissa White, she's also a violinist, um, she's the co-founder of Intermission, we got to talking about you know, all of the ways that 
yoga was impacting our lives, musically and otherwise, and how much we wish we'd had a mindful movement practice like yoga when we were in our formative years of training, you know, practicing so much. You don't quite think about your body in the same way, um, you know, in your teenage years as you do in your 20s and 30s and so on. You know, everything just sort of starts to solidify and get, <laughs> get a little creakier um, the more the years pass. So uh, we wanted to find a way to share all of the ideas that we were learning in yoga classes with our colleagues and our students. So we founded Intermission. Um, we do retreats for professionals, workshops for students. We have an app um, that's free. So yeah, this, um, this class that I'll be doing is sort of, you don't need any yoga experience. It's not about you know being flexible or twisting yourself into a pretzel. It's just um, learning some stretches for the arms and hands, things that anyone can do actually, not just musicians. We all spend so much time typing, texting, driving. Uh, we use our hands a lot and it's, it's good to, to learn ways to counter those movements. Um, we'll deal with just some alignment ideas, ways that we can stand and sit um, in a more healthy way and bring the instrument to us. Obviously, I know as pianists, that's a little bit more difficult, but, but just finding optimal ways of positioning ourselves against gravity um, and then just get the, the blood moving, um, just some general like healthy tips for musicians that that will be the focus yeah no i think it's wonderful and your sentiment of like you said being at one with your instrument is so important because so often i think you're right we don't receive that advice or that mindset in music college it's much more about the kind of technical aspect of playing your instrument as opposed yeah. to how you actually just be at ease with it so. yeah i i mean i definitely didn't receive that in my mu musical education it was all about the hands and the fingers and making the sound at any cost um, but it didn't really deal with the body as a whole and the the person as a whole and i think that um, yoga is so helpful in starting to connect all the individual pieces of the person. Um, and I think there are such clear intersections with music making. On to this evening's performance, so your program for Classical Vauxhall. So we've given it the title, The Best of the Special Relationship, obviously music from both sides of the Atlantic. Um, probably self-evident seeing as you're British and American citizens, but in terms of the music itself, like, do you want to tell us just a little bit about your choice of program and maybe the choice of the composers, but also is there anything particularly that the audience should be made aware of maybe about your program or your mindset or what their mindset should be listening to it maybe? Do you want to start? I feel like I've blabbered more than you have. It's, I mean, firstly, I think it's music we love. Secondly, I think it's music that all deserves to be heard more. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I think one of the great gifts of this pandemic has been that we've been able to be a bit more adventurous with programming, you know, because sometimes, you know, normal life we're told by promoters, oh, we must fill the hall and have the big name composers. But actually, it's been wonderful to see how, how willing audiences are to come on journeys and hear some perhaps sort of repertoire that, yeah, really deserves to be heard much more than it is. Um, so yeah, we've got how many, three, three Americans and three British composers? Or we, we've got a, 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 yes. a balance anyway. Um, and definitely, yeah, some names who really deserve to be better known. Um, and some of whom by virtue of their gender or, or their skin colour were sadly, um, for historical reasons, overlooked in ways that were horribly undeserved. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Florence Price, who oh, we're playing a little Florence Price at the end. Give it away. You know, oh, okay, I won't. No, it's okay. No, I mean, <laughs> said, said, said herself that, you know, she felt she had this sort of twin handicap of both sex and race. And, and you know, that there is sort of, yeah, so much evidence that composers were overlooked completely unfairly and so I think just to be able to bring voices to the fore that you know by any standards just deserve this wonderful music to be heard I yeah. think is a real joy for us. Definitely I mean I think um, luckily um, Amy Beach, Samuel Coleridge Taylor they are coming into fashion more um, and totally deservedly so so um, we're very happy to, to be on that train. Um, and then actually you'll hear one, one of the um, Yuri Posty premieres um, that was written for us for the jukebox um, by Cheryl Francis Hode, with, who, who, who I was at university on. with and, and just as a wonderful, wonderful young composer. Um, yeah. Actually, we're, we're not young anymore, are we? But, you know, it's still... <laughs> forever young, forever young. Um, well, guys, listen, we're really looking forward to your concert and I hope you enjoy performing. But for now, we will enjoy your concert online. So guys, thanks so much and enjoy. Thank, Thank you. you.
I hope you enjoyed that, everybody, as much as I did. What a wonderful performance from Elena and Tom. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow at the same time, here, same place, for the wonderful duo of Jess Gillam, saxophone, and Zeynep Azuka, piano. We're delighted to bring you these concerts free of charge, but if you're in a position to make a donation to support the future of classical voxel, please do consider doing so. And until tomorrow, take care.